So this is the 30th anniversary of the Royal Alexandra National Arts Center's theater production of Dry Lips Out of Move to Kapiskasi. Mm -hmm. 1991. Yeah. Uh, uh, That's it. 1991. I remember it has a bit of a bittersweet quick memory for me because my brother passed away uh, the year before. Yeah. He had worked on the original production as a choreographer at Pass Marat. And, uh, and then he got sick and passed away uh, in October of 1990. So 1991, the following year is when this all this happened. And he, he, so unfortunately, he wasn't a part of it. And, uh, but he, and so he was much missed and his contribution to the development of the piece was much appreciated and, much, and, be and beautifully remembered. Yeah, the dance sequences were his, you know, originally. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and he, also was he also was involved with the creation of the Res Sisters, the choreography for he that. Was, yes, he was. Yeah. You know what, the funny thing, you know, I don't know if you remember the production itself that we had the Royal Acts with, but uh, Doris Linkdale played Nana Bush uh, in the evenings, but the, and the two matinees were, she was replaced by Gloria Escobar, <laughs> who was the most hysterical woman alive on the planet. <laughs> anyway, and the way Renee had choreographed it, uh, she's, she's a stripper, right, but in a strip scene. And uh, the boys are sitting at the table having, having drinking, just having a, a wonderful time, and the, you know, as, as boys will do. And, uh, and, and the way Re Re Renee had choreographed the sequence, she's wearing this outrageous strippers outfit, of course, with tassels, and the whole thing, man. That tassel idea was his, Renee's idea. And uh, so at one point he has his, with Doris it was relatively easy. To, for the, for that, there are six, five or six of them around, sitting around the table. And they had to, uh, they put up their hands like this, their right hand, and, and the point is for the stripper to sit, use it as a chair, the five hands, and then the, and then the music is just banging away and everything's just rocking away. And then they have, the boys have to lift her like this as part of the choreography, right? And, and, and they have to make it look effortless. So, so with Doris, it was difficult enough. But when it came, <laughs> well, okay, yeah. <laughs> Very hard time. <laughs> they had a, not only did they have a hard time doing it, they also had a, an even harder time making it look easy, right? Because <laughs> it wasn't easy at all. Oh, that was hysterical. There were so many funny movements, movements, <laughs> movement, funny, funny uh, incidents throughout the production of that piece. Because it's it's such an outrageous piece. Yeah, there's great stories about Gloria and about the, the two pieces because we had such a fabulous time with them. It so was magical experiences. So Go ahead. That, that's what I want to ask you about. Is it? It seemed like really a, a really special time for the creation of these works, mm -hmm. uh, and and the community you built around them because it used a lot of the same people. Mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah. Well, it wasn't. I wasn't alone. I didn't do it by myself. I, I did it with the support and the collaboration of many, many brilliant people. There was, it was one of those situations where the right, pe the right people came together at the right time, at the right place, you know, which is frequently the case with good things that happen yes. eh? and bad things, I suppose. But uh, we don't think about the bad things. We just think about the good things. And uh, just the right combination of people came together and there they were. And a large part of that, of course, we are, we're all responsible for creating this stuff collaboration, uh, uh, but a major part of that, of course, was Larry Lewis, the director, who passed away in 19... I remember he passed away the... <laughs> My point of reference for his passing, I said, it must have been around this time, June the 7th. Uh, really, if you look back to the records of uh, the night Mike Harris got elected premier, oh Jerry, it was that night oh. when the election was announced. He died at almost, I think, I think the election must have given him a heart attack. You, you talk about all the good times and, yeah. and the interesting people that you worked with. And mm -hmm. you also talked about the tears. And yeah. it seems to me that both the Red Sisters and Dry Lips combine both. They did. They they're really pain, did. And, but there is great joy. Yeah. Well, that's my, I, it, it turns out that it's my specialty. I, I write comedy, yes. It comes very naturally to me, write comedy. I like being funny. I like making people, people laugh. But I also have a great talent for tragedy, and so I'm told. And uh, and I remember the precise moment in Dry Lips, uh, especially in Dry Lips, I don't know if in that one, where I where we made people laugh and cry at the very same time, where the tears of sorrow and the tears of joy collided. And that's the moment when uh, uh, Gary Farmer is screaming from the center of the stage over, this, over the dead body of Simon Starblanket. 
than telling God to just come down and go, go what it, bleep himself. And, uh, and then the light comes up, 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 up above and there's, there she is as a woman, first of all, with a beard, bare-breasted on top of that, uh, sitting on the toilet reading a newspaper, you know? So at that precise moment, people were bawling and then laughing hysterically at the same time. I remember, and that's, that was a classic moment. So is, it, is it fair to say that that actually is part of Cree culture? Being no, able it's, to take no, it's, no, it's very unfair of you to say that. Just kidding. <laughs> I like the way you couched it. Is it fair? It's like you're so polite. Can I see this? No, of course it is. Yes, it is. You know, I mean, I just finished a project. Oh my God, I just finished the big, big magnum opus of my life. It's uh, we're sending, sending off to the printers tomorrow morning. Uh, big book. This is, this is your uh, memoirs coming out yes, in September. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, how do you know? Oh, I know cer certain things. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. It's true. You, you're, the kind, you're the kind of guy who knows all kinds of interesting things. I forgot about that. Anyway, uh, so, uh, uh, and that's what I said. So I, I was working with a fabulous editor. Well, she just, we just talked this morning. And off she went with the manuscript. Oh, God, we worked hard at it. And uh, she, again, there's another example of a fabulous collaboration. That book is not the result just of me. It's also the result of her work. She was brilliant. Martha Kenya Forstner. Anyway, and uh, she, uh, at Double Day Books. Uh, anyway, she, uh, I said to her, she, because she hadn't worked with me before, that a reserve is like Toontown. It's a Toontown. When you step on reserve, like, you're, you're, your wife's from a reserve, right? Mm -hmm. White, Lake, White Fish Lake? Yeah, that's what I said to somebody. White Fish Lake. Anyway, it's a reserve. As soon as you step on the reserve land, you have, you, of course, you've been on a reserve, right? Mm -hmm. the, the rules change. There's a certain irreality about life at a reserve. It's like twice as funny. You start laughing a lot. And, uh, but there's also very tragic at the same time. Tragic things happen on the reserves. And, uh, and sometimes they happen cheek by jowl. And my reserve up in Northern Manitoba was certainly like that. And every reserve ever been to has been like that. You, laugh, you start to laugh more. It's just, there's silly places. And they're like, and the languages, the way the languages are structured as well, they're very clown-like. They're very cartoon-like. Life achieves kind of a, 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 a life uh, puts on a very um, clown-like aspect, car a cartoon aspect. Things are so silly. People are so silly. The language is so silly, and uh, so that uh, it's. So I, I started calling after we after I saw Who Framed Roger Rabbit, the movie that everybody's seen, of course, which is a, com a combination of cartoons and real people uh, interacting. Uh, that's what reserve life is like. It's like it's, I start, so I started ca calling at that point in time reserve cartoon towns. The toon towns, where uh, you know, for instance, to give you an exact example, classic example, uh, Wiley Wiley Coyote, you know, the coyote, uh, the cartoon character. How many times have we seen him killed? You know, and he <laughs> to death and run over train. Finish the guy. <laughs> I mean, think it's the funniest thing we've ever seen. We're watching tragedy while we're laughing. That's that's toon town, you know? and that's what reserves are like. And uh, so it is fair to say that uh, the, 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 the character of those two pieces and other work of mine has a very cartoon-like character. You know? But then you think, when you think of it, much of the show business has to have that quality. You know, I was thinking, I got severely criticized one time, uh, God knows how everybody has, and said that and there, there's, something, there's something cartoonish about it, something like that somebody said, and I won't name which critic, I think she's still around. <laughs> <laughs> Her name first name begins with a K. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, and and it's and and I and I didn't of course react, but I said to myself, but that's the point. I was trying to be cartoon like. She obviously she would never been on a reserve, but but then you look at any musical, okay? Chicago, are those cartoons or are they not? You know, Velma Kelly and what's the other one? Uh, Oh, McKelly and Roxy Hart. Roxy Hart, Roxy Hart. Yeah. Those, I mean, what real woman is, is like that, you know, in real life? You know, any Gilbert and Sullivan opera, do women act like that in real life? No, they're cartoons, of course. And that's the point. That's, that show business is about turning life into magic, into cartoon-like magic, you know, to, to entertain people, to make them laugh. So, yes, uh, reserve life is very cartoon-like, and so is my work. And it, it's because I actually I didn't grow up on a reserve. I come from a reserve, but I, we, I never we never lived on it. We had a house there, but we hardly ever spent time there. Way up in northern Manitoba, close to Nunavut, 
and we were and the reason we hardly ever spent time there is we, we went there for weddings and funerals and Christmas and stuff like that, special events. For the rest of the time, we always lived on the land. We were caribou hunters. We were, we were fishermen. We were this, we were that. We were always living with, with nature and on, in nature. So, but I do nominally come from a reserve. I am a status Indian from Broche, Manitoba, all that stuff. So, yes, I have a very cartoon-like personality, so I'm told. And I enjoy that. To me, that's a compliment because I like to laugh. You know, Paul Souls, it's a, 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 laughing is a survival mechanism. No, I, you know, and that's what show business is about. That is to make people laugh, make people joyful. And look what happened just now that, with the pandemic, you know? There was no theater for, what, uh, a year and a half? Yeah, there still isn't here, you know? Yeah, and I'm walking into a situation where I'm, help, uh, I'm glad to be of assistance uh, at, at theaters where that are struggling back to life. It's just happened in the years at Manitoba Theater Center and now Stratford is coming up for me, et cetera, et cetera. So lucky to be able to say that. Uh, <clears throat> but the thing that people uh, noticed about that absence of theater and culture and music, live music in their lives, uh, is that there was a, they were getting mentally ill, emotionally ill, the depression, and even suicidal thoughts entered many people's minds at, at some point or other. And that's the role of, of art. It's, to, it's, it's, it's a necessary part of life. It keeps our brains and our hearts alive, you know, with joy and beauty. And it would be like having the earth, imagine a planet with no trees, you know? It's that kind of thing, that kind of absence. Not uh, uh, keeping, keeping in mind that without trees, we wouldn't even have air to breathe, you know, no chlorophyll. All that stuff, you know, people forget that this stuff is here for, it's not here just for decoration. It's here, theater and the arts and music. Uh, I miss, I, one of my favorite things to do in Europe, and we do a lot, we, I still live in Europe part of the year, is go to the symphony concerts at the big concert halls and the opera houses, right? Oh my goodness, to watch the best people in the world perform. And I haven't had that for a year and a half now. We had to flee, we live in Naples these days. Italy. So we had last year, a year and a half ago, we had to flee Italy, literally. And so, and I left behind about four very expensive tickets at the, Na at the Naples Opera House, which is called El, Gran, El, San, El Teatro de San Carlo. It's one of the great opera houses of the world. And, um, and I said to him, I said to myself, should I go back? Well, they couldn't reimburse. There was no mechanism for that. So I, I just said, you couldn't even get into the box office because it was closed. Uh, so I said to myself, I am glad, it cost me about $300 equivalent. And I said to myself, I'm glad to be, it's a point of pride for me able to contribute to a, an organization, namely the theater, that has given me so much joy over these past number of years, and that has given so much joy to people. They deserve this money, it's a gift, thank you. And I never regretted spending that money, wasting, to me it wasn't a waste of money. I never regretted it for a second, because it's, it's a fundamental expense we need to spend that money <laughs> on these things. And uh, <clears throat> so we just come, th come through an experience of spiritual uh, bankruptcy in that sense, you know? Mm -hmm. And it just only goes to show how necessary it is for us to pull ourselves out, that's out of that spiritual bankruptcy and bring our brains and our hearts and our emotions back to life. And, uh, and the other thing is, uh, it's like, and you really notice it in Europe, all the beautiful churches, they're all empty because nobody prays anymore. So that leads me to this question. Do you think we no longer have a mythology? Uh, I mean, of course, I, I'm assuming that, you know, Christianity is a mythology as well, it, you know. Uh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes. Uh, so, and, and I guess now our mythology is what, the Marvel superheroes? I, I don't know. Okay, uh, I'll tell you. First of all, mythology and theology are intertwined. They serve the same purpose, sort of. A myth the difference between mythology and theology, is, and I studied this material for many, many years. I mean, my, my work, my entire body was so much about that, addressing these questions. Um, the theology is about uh, the study of gods. A mythology is about the study of gods and men, humanity. Mm -hmm. So yeah, mythology is about the study of God, about divinity and humanity whereas theology is about the study of divinity only. Yeah? And, uh, and so in order for the, uh, one to function uh, fully, 
one has to, in order for us to be able to pray, to get down on our knees, do this with our hands, make a sign of the cross, and all that kind of stuff, um, we have to have a mythology, a theology that is alive. Eh? We have to have gods that live. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the reason and and because of this, uh, and this what this pandemic has shown us is that we have become so arrogant as a, as a civilization that we no longer need God anymore. We have become God. We can science has given us the capacity. Science and technology have given us the capacity to do godlike things, like send messages across entire continents at the snap of a finger. Okay? And so, at one point in our lives, that mythology was very much alive. And it, uh, and it no longer is. And we, the artists of this generation, are working at putting that mythology, bringing that mythology back to life. That's our purpose. Uh, and uh, so, therefore, we, have, we need access to theaters. We need access to concert halls. You know, we need access to uh, nightclubs. You know, we need access to all these places where people can go and just breathe, you know, and cry and laugh, all these wonderful things. And so uh, the Royal Alex uh, really was uh, a gift from heaven for me to be able to walk in there and put on a show with all my friends and, uh, and, uh, and make people laugh, make people cry and <laughs> it shocked, <laughs> shocked the living daylights and I said people, oh, I love those stories. I mean, you were there, you saw them all, you know, but about that. is it true that a, a woman had a heart attack? Well, I, no, I, that's not true. I heard that story. You know, but she dragged out of the theater with her, she left her shoes behind. <laughs> she took her, the ushers took her to the washroom. They sprinkled her face with water. This is the story I heard. Sprinkled her face with water and then and, and, and offered to call a taxi, right? And she said, No, I'm going to take me back into that theater and I, I want to watch this show to the end. She said, That's the story I heard. What, what does that know, it's, it's, there's, there's always There's always truth in the stuff, but it, it, I don't think it happened quite like that. But yeah, there's stuff happens all the time but especially around, around dry lips it mm. really was for many people you know who lived in a very i don't want to say closed off world but a, a very isolated world mm. um uh they hadn't thought of of life in a reservation and what what those people are like what they have to endure and it it just really was a a complete, complete uh, shock to, to some people, okay, and then some, people. Just, some people, yeah. Some some people just couldn't understand the various layers that yeah. the show worked on, you know. And, yeah, yeah. I, I was writing three layers. I write the, 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 the level of divinity, the level of humanity, and the level of nature, and the tripartite. It's a tripartite kind of storytelling. In order to really fully understand the material. You have to understand what those symbols stand for. You have to understand what Hera, and I have the principal female character in the play is called Hera, who was a mother earth goddess from Greek mythology. And she, and she comes from a period of uh, human history where God, the Christian God, had a wife. And to Christians, the idea of God having a wife is an obscene idea. It's iconoclastic, you know? But there was a point, in, and that's the question we have. Native people have a big question for Christianity. When the, when the Christian God arrived here in 1492, the big question we have for him over the centuries is still, where, why did you come alone? Where is your wife or your girlfriend? What are you anyway? What precisely are you? And uh, so very, very, we we're, were posing very tough questions, a lot of, and a lot of people didn't understand that those questions had to be asked at certain levels of our, of our uh, consciousness. So yes, people were shocked, but then you have to understand too, at the same, very same time, the other, the other half of the audience was thrilled to shreds. Those are all good things. Yeah, I loved it. Because uh, people, uh, you know, people always warn me, my memoir is about such and such a thing, there's certain topics being touched on in my memoir that's coming out soon. And people will say, oh, it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna be controversial. Because that's their warning. Well, to me, controversy, like, you know, you're talking money <laughs> here. You're talking box office sales, right? There's nothing great as great as uh, more, uh, the cells like controversy. You know, people should should be able to have to fight their way into the theater through crowds of protesters in order to see that show. Well, that's you know, how badly they should want to see it, and that's how powerful that statement being made on that stage should be. Yeah, the opposite. The opposite would be boredom, not caring yeah. at all. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah.
to be indifferent to it. Yeah? Completely indifferent to I don't, it. I don't, no, no, it cause, and it's still causing waves. You know, it's still, it lives on as a piece of world literature. It's uh, the grand, uh, uh, and the rest is just, they're, they're now, they've now been absorbed into the world literature. And, uh, and, uh, and like, I don't wanna uh, brag because I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not I, I, I don't like to, I don't play, I don't blow my own horn because I don't play a horn. I play the piano, okay? I'm a piano <laughs> player. <laughs> and, uh, but it's been, it's been, it's right up there among the gods of, of the play writing well, discipline, you know? Man, well, let me ask this question just, because how, how do people in other countries produce the show? Because they obviously can't have uh, indigenous actors play the play. Oh, okay. uh, well, no, they just use, in Japan, for instance, they use Japanese actors in Tokyo, which is the best production of Zara so, which ever. I was in Japan, in, to in Japanese with Japanese actors, loved it. So, so you, love it. and so this, this question about cultural appropriation, which sometimes I, th I find is not, is not helpful, uh, certainly doesn't apply because it, people would miss out on something. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't believe in it either, this cultural, but yeah, I like the way uh, Alexander McCall Smith, the Scottish novelist, uh, uh, said it, he said it best when he said, because he writes about it, he's a white, straight, a, a heterosexual uh, male living in Scotland, he's Scottish, and, he's, and he writes about black people, he writes about a black woman in Zimbabwe, or what is now Zimbabwe, it used to be uh, yeah. Rhodesia back in his day, yeah. uh, back in the day when this story, those stories happened. Anyway, uh, he said, no, I don't believe, I don't do cultural appropriation. I do cultural admiration. That's, that's how I put it, you know? People love us so much that they want to be us, you know? And that's a compliment. That's what I want. And yeah, then the, no, the, the, the talk about only, only so-and-so should play so-and-so. That causes nothing but the division and, uh, and except, you know, like exterior, I don't know, what's the word, um, uh, exclusivity? exclusionary, whatever, it causes, and hate, ultimately hatred. It causes, it causes hatred, and you don't want to do that. You want to, you want to cause love. That's yeah, so, so similar to what you've always done with your work, like, like yeah. in Dry Lips, you know, Greek mythology, Christian mythology, Cree mythology, combine them. In, in, I'm excited, yeah. Absolutely, I love doing that. And I, so I, have, I have exceptional, uh, I've had exceptional teachers in my time. And I have a wonderful education, so I'm, I'm, I and I have a limited amount of time left to live, just like you. And uh, um, and I want to maximize all those views, you know. I don't want to be I don't want to be stopped. I don't want to be silenced by political correctness, and I won't be. I just have one more question, and and that is, this, uh, just if you if you want to give us some thoughts about reconciliation, right. uh, especially, you know, now that this this you know, terrible discovery of 215 uh, remains of, of, of children have been found. You know, it, it brings this up again, a very, not an easy answer to, the, to any of this sort of stuff, but what is your take on, on how reconciliation can happen? Well, when the news first broke, I was speechless. I was asked for an interview immediately by, uh, by the CBC. Uh, and I said, I have no words for it. Words for this emotion do not exist, so I have nothing to say. Even if I did, how, how, could I, how would I say it? So I refused them very quiet, very politely, and they understood. But uh, I can, you know, one person, namely me, for instance, I can only do so much. You know, I'm here to create beauty. That's my business, the creation of beauty and the, and the, uh, the well-being of the human spirit to contribute the health of the human spirit. That's part of my job, a very large part of my job as it is of any artist, is just to continue what I've been doing all my life, all my adult life, is creating beautiful art. The more, like, like, on, like in Toontown, the greater the tragedy, the more beautiful the song I have to create. And that's my answer. <laughs> no, no it's, it's remarkable when you, when you think about your parents' life. Yeah. Very, well, very you, have to, you have to, you have to read my book. To, 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 to see all that, that transformation. Yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. So uh, I only found out about it yesterday, so uh, it was exciting to, to discover it. Yeah, uh, so. yeah so just beginning to trickle out. And September is what, I to was what I'm told it will be published. September 28, yeah. Okay, well, that, we have something to look forward to. Anyway, thanks a lot. I hope to talk to you soon.
Yeah, and uh, have a wonderful, wonderful evening. And uh, and I certainly am true, and I have to get on uh, the blower here to get, send my last note to the publishing house. Okay. Yeah, they give me a deadline at five o'clock, and it'll take about 15 minutes, but still, I won't have it right. Okay. <laughs> okay, you have a good day. And thank you so much for interviewing me. And hi to David, eh? I will. And, indeed, yeah. and everybody else, Brian and all that. I know, yeah, yeah. Great bunch of people. And everything else. And so when you get to, back to the role, Alex, have you, have you been inside the theater recently? Yeah, I, I <laughs> go there once in a while. Theater, I'd like you to get uh, kneel down and kiss the floor for me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>